Well, thank you. Yeah, well, this is certainly uh, good to be with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, just want to say this has been the busiest year since the, the COVID uh, came in the sense that uh, lots of travels uh, had lots of opportunities as Canada has opened its door again. And uh, so I've been doing a lot of traveling up into both the West Coast of Canada, the Maritimes, and uh, also preaching in various places throughout the United States, as well as continuing a, a very full Zoom ministry that hasn't seemed to have disappeared uh, with COVID. So it's kind of almost double duty, but uh, very thankful for the opportunities to share the word of God in various places. And anyway, this uh, this day, I'd like to, if you got your Bibles there, I'd like you to turn with me to First John the first epistle of John, and I'm going to read the first four verses of first epistle of John. And so it begins this way. I'm sure we're very familiar with it, but it's a wonderful portion of the word of God. Uh, we're going to read verses one through four. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And again, the Lord will bless that short reading from the Word of God. Now, the unanimous testimony about First John is that it was written by John, even though he doesn't mention his name anywhere in the epistle. Uh, but the Themes that are very similar to those that are found in John's gospel, as well as the universal testimony of the church fathers and the style of the book, all would indicate without question that this is indeed John the Apostle. Now, what is so fascinating about John is that as you look at the gospel accounts, of course, he's mentioned frequently in the synoptic gospels. Uh, of kind of part of that inner circle, uh, Peter, James, and John, that were yeah, very uh, close to the Lord Jesus. Uh, again, we'd say the Lord has doesn't have favorites, but he does have intimates. And uh, these three certainly were those intimates, uh, Peter, James, and John. And then we see him mentioned early on in the book of Acts. And I'd like you to just to look at the last time he's mentioned in Acts uh, by name is Acts chapter 4 where he's mentioned a couple of times in Acts 4 and verse 13, where it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And then verse 19, uh, Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to, the, uh, to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. And then it just seems as if John disappears off the scene altogether. He's not hardly mentioned at all. In fact, one of the reference to him is in the book of Galatians. If you look at Galatians uh, chapter 2 and verse 9, we find John mentioned again, uh, where it says, And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. But after that, there's no mention of John, and it seems like decades go by. In fact, the 40s, the 50s, and I'm not talking about the 1940s, I'm talking about AD 40, AD 50, AD 60, AD 70, John is not heard from not mentioned anywhere in the testimony of Scripture. And then all of a sudden, many believe that he wrote this book in the 80s, maybe 85, or some say even into the 90s, maybe 90 or 97 is the, the, the longest one I've heard, 
But the thought is this, that that for, for decades, it just seems like he disappears. Now, it doesn't mean he disappeared. He was probably very active in serving the Lord in various ways. But as far as the record of Scripture was concerned, there was nothing heard from John. And then all of a sudden, in the 80s or early 90s, he stirred to activity and he picks up his pen. And all of a sudden, we start to get his gospel, his epistles, of course, the book of Revelation, all of these coming late in the day as far as the Christian testimony is concerned. And so the, the question is, why? What is, what's happened to stir? Of course, we know from the, the, the side of the Lord, uh, you know, we know holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So we know the Spirit of God moved him to do this. But from the human side, you might ask yourself, why all of a sudden is John caused to pick up his pen? I want to suggest to you that the answer is very simple. False views of Christ were beginning to circulate in the church. And these false views of Christ that, that diminished either the idea of the deity of Christ or the true humanity of Christ stirred John to pick up his pen and give correction to these false ideas. And so we find this epistle uh, that is just uh, stirred uh, by what's going on in this false teaching. Now, again, he doesn't mention his name. He doesn't even tell us who he's writing to. Uh, there's an absence of greetings. Uh, some of Paul's letters, he's he's always greeting people like that in chapter 16 of Romans. He's got all these people he mentions. None of that is found in the first epistle of John. And it's the idea is almost like this, that John, he, he, he is so caught up with these false views that have been perpetrated that all he can think of is correcting this error. And so it's almost like he's got tunnel vision, no mention of who is receiving the letter, no mention of any of these other things. It's just, I have to defend the honor of the one who has done so much for me. And so he is really being given this very serious task of defending the truth and guarding the saints. Nothing else seems to be important to John than this idea of presenting the truth of the person of Christ and defending his honor and uh, certainly answering these critics. If this is the correct dating uh, in the 80s or early 90s, it would tell us that John is now in his own 80s. He's uh, 80 years of age at least. And the Lord in his providence, it would seem, allowed John to live into a ripe old age so that he could refute the errors that had developed over time. And so that's his, his purpose quite clearly. Uh, and so the reason, reason for writing, the primary reason for writing. Now, he's going to tell us a lot of reasons why he's written to them, but the primary reason that he writes to them is the idea of combating error. And of course, every generation, every generation has to face error in their particular generation that needs to be combated. And nobody likes conflict. Nobody likes to be uh, out there, as it were, uh, kind of contending for the faith. But we're told in Scripture to earnestly contend for the faith, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. We're told that in Jude verse 3. And so certainly we need to do that. In fact, if we look at the early days of the assembly movement, we think of men like John Nelson Darby. And one of his first writings was a book combating the the errors of higher criticism, which were very dominant in his days. And, uh, and he wrote a book called The Irrationality of Infidelity. And as it were, he took up his pen and he answered these higher critics and, and he did it very effectively. And so again, we've got to recognize it. We may have battles in our day, false teaching that has to be combated. And so what were the wrong views that John is dealing with here? First of all, uh, I want you to see that John tells us who is teaching these views. And again, we got to keep in mind, this man is known as the apostle of love. But when it comes to people giving false views about the Lord Jesus, uh, you have to say uh, the way he describes them is pretty strong language. And so look at chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And so he tells us 
you got to be careful. There's a lot of false prophets there that have already many, notice he says, have gone out into the world. Look back in chapter 2, verse 18, perhaps even stronger language, and he says this, little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. And so he really he calls these false teachers false prophets and antichrists. <laughs> That's pretty strong language. Uh, again, so we see something of his passion uh, for doctrine here. Uh, it, it seems shocking to us almost to hear this from the one who was known as the apostle of love. So what is it that he's dealing with? Well, many believe that what he's dealing with is two things, really. One is Gnosticism. Now, this is in an early form. It's not fully blown, not fully developed, but but the Gnostic thinking is beginning to appear. And so what do we mean by Gnosticism? Well, this really helped me in understanding it. If agnostic, if somebody's an agnostic, it means I don't know. By the way, if somebody comes up to you and say, well, I'm agnostic, you say, well, why would you want to be ignorant? Because that's the idea of agnostic. It's somebody who's ignorant. They don't know. They don't know what, what you know, they don't think it's possible to know even. And so agnostic is somebody who says, I don't know. And Gnostic is somebody who claims I am in the know. I am one of the initiated ones. I have superior knowledge. And basically this teaching, this, this Gnosticism, they believe that Christianity was okay as far as it went. But they, because of their initiated into this higher realm of knowledge, they had an advance on Christianity. They had gone beyond just that basic stuff that these apostles taught, and they had got a kind of a, a greater light, uh, uh, an advance in their view of the things of God. And so although it wasn't fully blown at this time, it was beginning to appear in embryo form. It's also dealt with in, in the Paul's letter to the Colossians. And it's really connected with this idea of knowledge falsely so called. Now, they thought they were in the know. They thought they, they had this special knowledge. And of course, one of the things that the Gnostics believed was that, that matter, by its very nature, was evil and non-material was good. And of course, it had a profound effect on the lives of those that held this teaching. Uh, and um, quite horrific, actually. And, and of course, we need to recognize this, that doctrine and conduct are always linked. If we have false views of things, it will result in a false way of living. And so certainly, this idea of Gnosticism, the supremacy of knowledge uh, that was only available to the to the initiated. This is, and by the way, you have to be you have to watch for people. Uh, I, I noticed that there's doctrine today where um, there's there's almost an intellectual arrogance with them, as if you know that if you don't hold to their particular doctrine, you're some kind of almost like a Neanderthal man. You know, you're you're kind of a numbskull if you don't understand uh, their clever doctrine of the day and there's this this spiritual pride connected with their knowledge and so we have to watch for that kind of thing now again according to the early church fathers this this teaching actually came from a man we're familiar with from the book of acts a man called simon the sorcerer or simon magus and the early church fathers believe that he went down uh, to alexandria in egypt and he was the one that initiated or brought in this teaching that we uh, know of as uh, Gnosticism. Uh, another key adherent was another man, also a native of Alexandria, a man called Corinthus. We'll consider him in a little while. But I just want you to notice something here, and that is this, that First of all, this era comes out of Alexandria. I want you to just be aware of that. I, I've come to the position and the condition in my mind now where I wonder, can any good thing come out of Alexandria? That's the way I feel. And, and so let me just say this. The critical text also originates in Alexandria. And again, the idea is this Gnostic influence. And so I just throw that out there. I'm not going to go much further on that. But certainly the hotbed of much heresy came out of Alexandria. 
Now, again, it's an adherence. How, what, how did this teaching affect them? Well, in two different ways. One, there was this, what we call asceticism and the ascetic view. And so because matter was evil, they sought to conquer their sinful desires. Uh, it had to be beaten down and crushed uh, in order to emaciate the, the soul so that it could be liberated to rise to this higher knowledge. And so Paul would deal with that in Colossians, and he would talk about these people who go around saying, touch not, taste not, handle not. Matter's evil. You almost have to stay away from it altogether. But it's very hard in a material world to stay away from material things. It's very difficult. But that was one side of this Gnostic era the other side was a more libertine view they they believe that um it the it, that it didn't really matter what you did in the flesh you could on you could be unbridled in indulging in the flesh because the only thing that mattered was the spirit and so as long as your spirit was in tune with god you could live basically as ever you would and so you have two kind of extremes of these gnostic views one that are kind of uh, almost beating their bodies and pulling them into subjection the other group that are doing whatever they like just a little word about this man uh Corinthus. Uh, again he we said he's from alexandria contemporary of john and polycarp a disciple of john he tells us in his writings that john denounced this man publicly on at least one occasion Irenaeus says that this epistle was written by John to refute the teaching of this man, Corinthus. What they taught was that Jesus was not a real man. If matter is evil, how could Jesus take on matter, material form? You see, in their minds, matter is evil. And so he had no real body. He was a phantom. Uh, he only seemed to be. I mean, what a statement. He only seemed to be. Uh, and so uh, they taught this, that uh, the Christ spirit descended upon the man Jesus at his baptism, left him before the cross, all of these kind of strange views. So when we come to this book, it's very difficult to, to analyze. You know, John is not logical, thoughtful like Paul, which his epistles are pretty easy to, to analyze. In fact, some people say when you come to First John, it almost defies analysis. One man has been helpful in saying that, in a sense, instead of thinking in a kind of a, a linear way, uh, one point after another, what John does is kind of a circular way of reasoning. He kind of goes around in circles, bringing the same truths over and over again. And some of the th basic truths that he kind of brings to us over and over again is this, that if somebody truly is a follower of the Lord, he will practice righteousness. It's one of the evidence of that the, the, they're the real deal, that they, they really have life. If you're really a true child of God, you'll practice righteousness. Secondly, if you're really a true child of God, you'll walk in love. You'll love the brethren. Again, these Gnostics, they thought they were so better than the ordinary Christians. In fact, they went out from us. They were not of us. And they looked down on the ordinary Christian and they didn't love the brethren. And then the third one is that they will, and of course, perhaps the most important one, as far as John is concerned, they will believe the truth. They will hold on to the truth, the truth that has been taught. So let's look at some of his own language as he tells us the reason that he's written this letter. Now, before we do, let's just notice, we said that it's obvious that it's John because uh, the style is very similar. So let's just go, first of all, to John's gospel, chapter 20 and verse 31. And we know that when it came to his gospel, he left us in no doubt the purpose of his writing, his gospel. John 20, verse 31, it says, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, that's the promised Messiah, the Son of God, Again, that's a reference to his deity, the eternal son who ever lived in the bosom of the father, and that believing you might have life through his name. These are written that you might. Now, when we go to 1 John, again, we want to notice the same style of uh, these are written 
that or these things right eye unto you. He, he kind of has that same idea. He wants to tell us why he's writing. First John 1 verse 4, these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Listen, if you have a wrong view of Christ, you will be robbed of joy because you'll be robbed of fellowship with God. You'll be robbed of salvation itself. You will not experience joy if you have a wrong view of God. These things I write unto you that your joy might be full. By the way, isn't it wonderful that one of the things that the apostle of love wants us to experience is fullness of joy, that we might enjoy fullness of joy in our personal experience. Chapter two, verse one, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. There's something else that would rob us of our joy. Now, these, these one group of Gnostics who feel like you can live as you please and it doesn't matter, uh, again, that would rob you of joy. It would break fellowship with God. And he wants you to know, sin not. He doesn't want you to continue to practice sin. He wants you to be delivered from sin and its power in your life. But again, he wants us to know that if any man does sin, and by the way, what a wonderful truth. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Chapter 2, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. By what a wonderful thing that is to know that our sins are forgiven. And why? For his name's sake. In other words, if you get him wrong, because his name implies everything about him, his character and everything else, if, if you're wrong on him, then... Could it be that your sins are not forgiven? But for his name's sake, your sins are forgiven. If you have a right view of Christ, you have a right Savior. Chapter 2, verse 26. These things I write unto you concerning them that seduce you. Isn't it interesting that these false teachers, although he calls them antichrists and false prophets, he says that their, their ministry, the way they work is very seductive. They use kind of clever arguments and, and they're, they're out there to seduce you. And so I'm writing to you concerning them that seduce you. I want you to understand who they are. I want you to understand how they think. And I want you to be delivered from them. Chapter 5, verse 13. This verse I love. Um, I think I, I, there's many reasons why I love this particular verse, but he says, these things have I written unto you that you be, that, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that ye have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. True assurance of salvation, that you may know that you have eternal life. I was raised in a religious system where it was considered to be presumptuous to say that you had eternal life because that religious system said what salvation was by faith in Christ plus good works. But the problem with that, that formula of faith in Christ plus good works is when you ask them, well, how many good works do I have to do in order to know that I'm saved? They can never give you an answer. And so you can never know for sure you have eternal life. But he says, these things I write to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know as a present possession and reality that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. What a wonderful thing it is to know that you have eternal life, to have that true assurance of salvation. And I don't want to presume that just because you're listening, that you have eternal life. Maybe you need to hear this message and be certain yourself that you have eternal life. John would show us how you can know for sure that you have the real thing, that you have eternal life. Because all these false teachers with their false gospels and their false messages are out there, and there's only one truth, and he wants us to be taken up with that one truth. Just before we go any further, just some of the key phrases that John will use. We won't um, uh, get time to develop everything today, but we want to just mention that some of the key uh, words and phrases of the epistle, uh, one of them we're going to examine is from the beginning. He wants us nine times he uses that in this epistle, from the beginning, that which is from the beginning. Uh, and again, it's important because these people are coming out with something that claims to be in advance of Christianity but it's not in harmony with that which was from the beginning. 
<laughs> and so we want to go back to the source. We want to go back to the beginning and understand what, what was from the beginning. And he wants us to understand that. And then manifested is another word uh, from the beginning, nine times manifested five times. And the idea of God making things known to us, making things evident to us, making things clear to us. Uh, commandment 13 times so they're just some of the the key words so let's just dive into the text now with that sorry lengthy introduction but very important in introduction when we look at uh, this opening section well in chapter one fellowship is obviously a key idea isn't it it's mentioned four times and so we notice in verse three that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son verse six if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth verse seven but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin so clearly fellowship is a key idea in this little section and so how do we know if we really have true fellowship with God? So let's look at verse one. So this is the first reference to that idea of the beginning. So he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. So which beginning is in John's mind here? That's what we've got to establish, because it's interesting that this idea of the beginning, we see we see it mentioned uh, in three different ways in Scripture. So, for instance, the one we're most familiar with is Genesis 1, verse 1, which is the beginning of space and time and matter as we know it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so that's when, as it were, time began. God existed before then, but in the beginning, God created the emphasis on his creation when he when he spoke the worlds into existence. And so the beginning of time as we know it. And then we go to the Gospel of John in chapter one. And we have, again, this idea of the beginning. But some have said that this beginning goes before Genesis chapter one. This is what we might call the unbeginning beginning. Because it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That takes us not to Genesis 1. That takes us way beyond Genesis 1 into eternity itself, doesn't it? That in eternity itself, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's speaking of the eternal uh, condition of the Father and the Son enjoying fellowship together in eternity past. And then, again, in John 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I want to suggest to you, now you may not agree with me, and that's okay, this is not an issue that's going to determine our eternal destiny, because uh, no question in my mind that John is not denying for a second the eternal sonship of Christ, but when he talks about the beginning here, I believe he's talking about John 1.14, he's talking about the incarnation, and specifically when we beheld his glory, even the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he's going back to the beginning of this revelation of the person of the Christ that came into the world. And so, again, I say this, he's not denying the eternal sonship of Christ, but in the light of false teachers coming in with their new things and new ideas, John went, wants us to get a good grip on the teaching which has been around from the beginning, from the beginning of the revelation of the person of Christ in John 1, 14, when the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And so he's really coming to the, the incarnation and particularly the, the beginning of of historic christian faith as christ is revealed uh, to his disciples this new era this new dispensation beginning with christ coming into the to the world and what he's telling us is this i want you to know that christ was no phantom here's the testimony of the apostles that which was from the beginning 
He says, first of all, which we have heard. He said, I, I can still remember. I can remember his words, even though I'm now an old man, I can actually still hear the echo of his words ringing in my ears. I heard him myself. I actually heard the one who is the word of life. I actually had the privilege of hearing him speak. Now, I'll tell you something. If you heard the Lord Jesus speak, it didn't matter whether you're 80 or 90, you would never forget hearing him speak. Oh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. And then he says, we didn't just hear him. We saw him. Yeah, we, we actually saw him. Uh, we were eyewitnesses. Uh, and of course, that's exactly what he says. That's what Peter says. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory. Peter would say in 2 Peter 1.16, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We have seen him. In fact, it wasn't just a glance here. We have seen it. Uh, we have seen, sorry, we have seen uh, with our eyes, we have looked upon. Notice that, which we have looked upon. That word, vine tells us it means to behold with careful contemplation. Uh, it, 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 the idea is we viewed attentively and carefully and deliberately. We, we interpreted the object. We, we got as close a look as you possibly could. We were really paying attention and looking and beholding and viewing. And then he says, and our hands have handled. That nails it. <laughs> he was no phantom. I actually held him. <laughs> uh, John laid his head on his bosom. He heard his heart beat. If anybody knows that Christ really came into the world and was truly man, it would be John because he got closer to him than any other human being. He said, uh, I actually, uh, well, I, I've handled him of the word of life. And of course, we know that even in his resurrection body, uh, he was still a real person, a real man, a risen man, but a real man, because uh, he, he says, uh, handle me and see that, 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 I, I, that I have flesh and bones, uh, insisting that they do, uh, that he's not some spirit, not some phantom. He has flesh and bones. Uh, he, Mary wanted to cling to his feet, said, don't cling on to me. Thomas was encouraged to place his hands in the wounds of the Savior. Jesus was a real man. The apostolic testimony leaves us in no doubt. In fact, uh, the scripture tells us that he was like us in every way except one, sin apart. But he was a real, real man. And he says, our hands have handled of the word of life. Now, what an interesting thing to call him, the word of life. Because it's a favorite term of John's. Uh, again, we already saw it in John 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Revelation 19, when we see the revelation of Christ coming out of heaven on a white horse, and, and it tells us that there's a title written with him. His name is called the word of God. And here, the word of life. And the word, the word is, of course, the word logos that we're very familiar with. And it conveys the idea of vehicles of thought. Uh, the idea is this, that if I, hopefully tonight, I am clearly expressing myself and in the process, I'm using words. Words is how we express ourselves. And so the idea is this, that God wanted to express himself to us and he did it by sending the word, the word becoming flesh. And, and what an expression of God. If you want to know what God is like, look at the Lord Jesus. In fact, John 1, 18, uh, it says, uh, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. He has told him out. That's the idea. And so the Lord Jesus is that, that way that God has communicated to the world his mind and heart most clearly. Jesus is the living word. This is the written word. But God is in the business of communication, and he communicated to us through the scriptures, and he has communicated to us very clearly through the Savior, the Logos of life. And by the way, he alone is the one who can bring real life. And so he tells us in verse 2, and it's in brackets, so it's a parenthetical verse, 
Uh, if you notice the brackets in verse two, it says, for the life was manifested, we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. And again, there's a reason why he wants to put that in there, because on the one hand, in the verse one, he's, he's emphasizing Jesus was really a man. Our hands have handled of the word of life. But in verse two, he wants us to know that this one who was really a man is also the one who was with the father in all eternity. But the life was manifested. There was a time that's that word manifested, rendered apparent, appear, uh, manifestly declare. The word of life was not hidden. It was revealed. And he says, and not only that, we have seen it. <laughs> we, we actually witnessed this life being manifest. And we bear witness. That's what the apostles were called to do, to testify of what they had seen and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father. So now he's acknowledging the eternal preexistence of the Lord Jesus that was with the Father and was manifested unto us. John is an apostle, a chosen witness. He's taking his call, calling seriously. And he says, notice that which we have seen. We have seen. It's not just himself, but he's calling all the apostolic witness. And he's saying, we've seen it. We bear witness. We'll stand in court of law anywhere, and we will bear the evidence that we have seen. This is that eternal life. And that eternal life is a person. Notice that we show unto you that eternal life, which was the Father and was manifested unto us. Now, I want to just take a minute to talk about eternal life. Because sometimes we automatically think eternal life means living forever. Well, let me tell you something. Unsaved people live forever too. But they do not have eternal life. <laughs> they have eternal misery, don't they? Eternal death, the second death. They will suffer throughout all eternity. But this is an epistle about eternal life. So what's the difference? Well, it's simply this. Again, an echo of the Gospel of John, but and the words of the Lord Jesus. John 17 and verse 3. John 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so in a real sense, we could say, actually, I have eternal life right now because I've been brought into this relationship with God the Father and with God the Son. And so I'm actually enjoying fellowship with, with these eternal persons. And so I'm enjoying that life of the eternal one, even in, in, in my own life right now. I'm enjoying this eternal life. So now he goes on and he talks about fellowship. He says, that which we have seen, verse 3, and heard, declare we unto you that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. He said the key word in the chapter is fellowship. If we want to enjoy fellowship with the Father and the Son, it's important that you believe the apostolic message. That message which was from the beginning, that Jesus was truly man. Yes, he was, but he was truly God. That, that we must believe that. There's no advance on that. He had to be God for his death to be sufficient to value the sin of the whole world. And he had to be man in order to die. Anything less than that would rob you of true fellowship with God and eternal life. Gnosticism, docetism, all of these strange views miss the mark. They may claim to have knowledge, the gnosis, but they do not enjoy fellowship with the Father and the Son. The Son and the Father have enjoyed fellowship together throughout the ages of eternity. But here, and I want you to get this, wonder of wonders. You and I can enjoy fellowship today with divine persons. Uh, 
And I wonder, do we really get that? Does it really sink into our tiny minds that we've been called into fellowship with divine persons, that we can enjoy daily communion with God the Father, God the Son, and yes, even God the Holy Spirit? Just look at 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, where we have uh, fellowship or communion of the Holy Ghost. And again, just wonderful to think that we've been brought into fellowship with divine persons. The, verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we know all about that, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. And can I say to you, dear Christian, assuming that you really do believe that Jesus is indeed truly man and truly God and that he came to die on Calvary's cross to pay the penalty of your sin, and you have come to a point where you've believed that, you've trusted in him, well, if you are in that happy condition, please do not lose the wonder of it all, that you have been called into fellowship with divine persons. This is a marvelous, marvelous privilege. And this is something that we should bask in and enjoy every single day of our lives. To think, God, would you, why would you want to have fellowship with me? <laughs> but you do, because of the work of Christ, because of who Jesus is, the one who has truly made God known to us, the true Logos who came into the world to die on Calvary's cross, to pay the penalty for our sin, so that we might now know we have eternal life and our sins are forgiven. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.